Waves of Destiny. In the heart of a rich neighborhood in Ghana, amidst the kind of opulence that whispers secrets of old money and discreet power, my life unfolds. Our home, a sprawling beach house kissed by the sea breeze, stands as a tribute to my parents' labor and ambition. The tranquility of the beach, with its endless expanse of golden sand meeting the azure waters, offers a stark contrast to the bustling city life, yet it mirrors the isolation that cloaks my existence. I am Ama, an 18-year-old who has learned to find solace in solitude. My parents, both pillars of professionalism and pragmatism, have sculpted a life for us that thrives on routine and respectability. In their world, there is no room for the frivolous or the fantastical. Supernatural tales are dismissed as mere child's play, and interactions are carefully curated to maintain a veneer of decorum. Their life's mantra, focus on your studies, avoid distractions, especially boys, for they bring nothing but trouble, has become mine by osmosis. Despite the gilded cage of my upbringing, I've never longed for an escape. My life, predictable and controlled, suits me just fine. I've mastered the art of being alone without being lonely, finding companionship in books and the quiet moments by the sea. Yet, even as I revel in my self-imposed isolation, I can't help but wonder if the world beyond my golden prison holds more than just the promise of disappointment and disillusionment. It's on one such day, as I tread the well-worn path of my daily routine, that my world is irrevocably changed. A discovery in our pool, something so out of place, so extraordinary, it threatens to unravel the very fabric of my reality. The discovery of the mermaid baby, a creature of myth nestled in the chlorinated waters of our pool, marks the beginning of an adventure that is anything but mundane. The morning had dawned like any other in our quiet corner of Ghana, with the sun casting a golden glow over the sea, making the waves sparkle like diamonds. My routine was a well-oiled machine, wake up, breakfast alone, a long walk along the beach, and then hours drowned in study. It was during one of these mundane mornings, the kind that blend into each other, that I found it. I remember walking past the pool, my thoughts lost in the complexities of my upcoming exams, when something unusual caught my eye. There, in the crystal-clear water of our meticulously maintained pool, was a creature. Not just any creature, but one that looked suspiciously like a baby, yet not entirely human. Its skin shimmered under the water, reflecting hues of the ocean, and for a moment, I was convinced my eyes were deceiving me. It's just a weird fish, I told myself, shaking my head in an attempt to dispel the illusion. My imagination is playing tricks on me. Curiosity, however, is a powerful force. I found myself drawn to the edge of the pool, my heart racing with a mixture of fear and fascination. The creature, or the thing, as I had begun to call it in my mind, seemed to notice my presence. With a grace that belied its strange form, it paddled closer, its eyes locking onto mine. For a moment, I considered calling out to my parents, but the thought was quickly dismissed. They were always busy, ensconced in their world of work and responsibilities, and had little patience for what they would surely dismiss as childish fantasies. Besides, how could I explain a mermaid baby in our pool without sounding delusional? Determined to prove to myself that I wasn't losing my grip on reality, I devised a plan to lure my father outside. There's a tree that's fallen into the pool, I lied, the words tasting strange on my tongue. It was a desperate measure, but desperation had become my unexpected companion suddenly. My father, concerned for the first time in what felt like forever, about the potential damage to his property, no less, hurried to the poolside, only to find the water undisturbed, the creature mysteriously vanished. I felt a mix of relief and disappointment as his gaze, filled with confusion and then annoyance, lingered on my face before he turned away, muttering about wasted time, work-induced stress, and returned inside, leaving me alone with my confusion. That evening, under the cover of darkness, my search for the thing turned into a comedic endeavor. I looked under sofas, in the kitchen sink, and even in the bushes, half expecting it to pop out like a misplaced sock. The absurdity of the situation wasn't lost on me, and I couldn't help but laugh at myself. Now I'm searching for mermaid babies in shrubbery, 
I chuckled, the sound echoing in the empty space. Just as I was about to give up, convinced that my mind had indeed played a cruel trick on me, I found it back in the pool, as if it had never left. The creature, with its curious eyes and gentle cooing, seemed almost pleased with the chaos it had caused. There you are, I whispered. Where did you come from? How'd you get in there? But the only response was a bubbly giggle, as if it knew a secret I was yet to uncover. I glance at the sea nearby, unable to understand how it got here. The shore was at least twenty feet away. Knowing I couldn't call my father again, I was unsure of what to do for a while. Eventually, as it continued to bob around in the water, I made a decision. Fearing a bite, I seized the pool net which was attached to a telepole, determined to scoop it up and return it to the sea. My plan was simple. Get it into the net and balance it all the way to the shore. Unfortunately, it wasn't as easy as I thought it would be. Every time I stretched the net after it, the thing darted away with surprising agility. Losing patience after roughly 90 minutes of futile attempts and needing to resolve the situation, I inhaled deeply and braced myself as I entered the pool, intending to swim to it, capture it, and liberate it. You're definitely not a shark, I said, now that I was closer and on the same level as it. I pray you're not a piranha either, I murmured, a mix of trepidation and determination in my voice. Just remember, I won't hesitate to spear you if you pull any stunts. The words felt strange, a half-hearted threat against something so small and mystical-looking. As I spoke, the creature ceased its frantic darting, its movement stilling as if my words had cast a spell of calm over it. Come here, I commanded softly more a plea than an order. To my surprise, it obeyed, gliding towards me with a grace that belied its earlier panic. Seizing the moment, I reached out tentatively, my hands hovering before finally making contact. The creature made no attempt to flee. Instead, it simply gazed up at me with a curious expression. Lifting it from the water, I felt it settle into my arms with an ease that stunned me its small form fitting against me as though it was made to be held and wanted to be. Its gaze, innocent and curious, met mine, and something within me shifted. A smile I couldn't resist broke through unto my lips as I looked down at the being cradled in my embrace. It was undeniably akin to a human infant, save for the tail that shimmered in hues of green and gold, a dazzling spectrum that captivated me. Where did you come from, huh? I found myself whispering to the creature, not expecting an answer, but compelled to ask. It remained silent, its eyes wide and curious, echoing the innocence of any infant I'd ever seen. Small, seemingly vulnerable, and so cute, it nonetheless possessed an adeptness in the water that contradicted its fragile appearance. The decision to keep it wasn't one I made consciously, I don't think. Something about its helplessness— made me unable to bear the thought of releasing such a delicate being back into the vast, unpredictable ocean without knowing exactly where it was going. You lost, huh? Where's your mom? That's when I felt a sudden shiver down my spine. A baby this small had to have a mother somewhere. I scurried out of the pool with the mermaid baby still clutched in my arms, eyes searching frantically for the thing I was feeling, a presence. The air around me thickened, charged with a kind of electricity that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Turning towards the sea, I caught sight of a figure sitting on a rock at the edge of the water, the waves lapping at the rocks about him. Even from the distance, it was clear he was unlike any man I had ever seen. His skin shimmered with an iridescent quality, mirroring the baby in my hands, but it was his tail that caught my breath a glimmering green, reflecting the sunlight in dazzling patterns, as if capturing the essence of the sea itself. His eyes, too, held the depths of the ocean, a mesmerizing gaze that seemed to pull me closer, despite the space between us. Time seemed to stand still as I found myself ensnared in his spell, unable to tear my eyes away or move. He didn't look surprised to see me at all, like he'd been watching me the whole time, I couldn't say how long I stood frozen. It was him who broke the moment, his movement subtle yet unmistakable. Did he just call me? The image of his hand, a beckoning gesture, 
played over and over in my mind. My heart was racing, its beats echoing in my ears like drums. Just the thought of approaching him turned me to ice. I considered running, but then I still had the baby. Finally, the rational solution occurred to me. If I return the baby, he should go away. With that, I cautiously approached the boundary, where the concrete edge of the pool met the expansive grass that stretched toward the seashore. It's here, at this liminal space, that I gently set the baby down. Shoo, I whispered, encouraging it. Go on, go to him. Shoo. What happened next caught me off guard. The merman suddenly leapt from the rock. Lifting my eyes, I saw him moving with unexpected speed, his hands dragging his shimmering tail along the grass, propelling him forward in a manner that sent shivers down my spine. I screamed and dashed inside, heart pounding in my chest. Fumbling with the lock, I secured myself inside, leaning against the door. After several tense moments, I felt compelled to peek out the window. The outside world appeared tranquil, devoid of the merman and baby, as if the intense encounter had been nothing but a figment of my imagination. With cautious steps, I went back outside, the silence around me both reassuring and unsettling. Then, a splash from the pool sliced through the quiet, drawing me towards it with dread. There, to my surprise, the mermaid baby floated, seemingly unharmed and as mystical as before. Before I could fully grasp the situation, a deep, calm voice permeated the air. Sorry I scared you. I whirled around to find the merman positioned comfortably near the pool, his tail partially submerged in the water, lending him a serene, almost natural presence, though he was so surreal. You had her out of the water for too long, he continued, his tone apologetic yet firm. I needed her back in. I glanced at the baby, then back at him. You don't have to be afraid of me, he said his voice a soothing balm to my startled heart. His smile was tender, like the embrace of a long-lost friend, warming me from the inside out. His appearance captivated me. Never in my life had I ever seen a boy so breathtakingly beautiful. Chocolate brown eyes and jet black dreadlocks gushed down his onyx shoulders onto muscles. Muscles, and more, muscles. And please, don't run away again, he was saying. My name is Kweku. Kweku's gaze held mine, a gentle amusement playing across his features. I knew you wouldn't hurt her, he said looking from the baby to me, and she likes you. I was right. What? I found myself actually responding. It must have been shocking to find her there in your pool, but I thought it was the best way. What? I managed to utter, realizing then that my ability to articulate had seemingly deserted me. It was the only way he replied, his voice a melody that seemed to ebb and flow with the tide. I wanted her to meet you, and you her. Finally, my mind caught up a bit. Wait, what? Are you saying that you put it in my pool? His surreal face looked taken aback, but he answered, I did. My brows furred. Glancing from the seashore to the pool looking at the distance, I realized something. You crawled across the grass from the sea just to drop your baby in my pool? Twice? The words tumbled out before I could catch them, a mix of accusation and disbelief coloring my tone. Four times, actually, he said casually. You missed her the first time. I can't believe this. How could you do that? It scared me. I nearly killed it. You were far from killing anything, he said, and please, she's not an... It... She's my daughter. She's a very special girl." His eyes lighting up with a father's pride was completely lost on me, since, number one, he looked like nineteen, number two. What kind of father just leaves his baby in a stranger's pool? I blurted. He peered at me then as if deliberating whether he should speak. The kind who's giving her to her mother. What? My ability to articulate, once again, deserted me. Kweku's gaze held mine, a blend of urgency and patience in his eyes. I'll explain, though this is not the way I had envisioned sharing this with you. Time isn't on our side, as I cannot remain on land indefinitely. I must return to the sea soon. He took a deep breath, almost as if bracing himself for the weight of his next words. I want you, Ama, to be the baby's mother. 
I've been watching you. For a long time, from the shadows of the sea, I've observed your kindness, your strength. You are the one, the only one, who can be her new mother. Shock coursed through me, a tidal wave of disbelief that left me momentarily speechless yet again. Why me? I managed to stammer, my mind racing to keep up. Where's her mother? A heavy silence followed my question. Kweku's face clouded over with a sadness. Her mother has died, he finally said, his voice barely above a whisper. He looked at me again, his gaze pleading for understanding. Please, Ama, understand this. She's too young to be motherless. She needs to bond to a mother, or she won't survive. It's a mermaid thing, he implored, noticing the skepticism in my gaze. The revelation of his purpose shook me to my core. Kweku was not merely a mysterious figure from the depths, but a father in search of a mother for his child, a child whose own mother had been lost to them. The gravity of his request for me to step into a role I felt utterly unprepared for was overwhelming, guilt twisted in my stomach, a sharp contrast to the skepticism that had shielded me from fully embracing this surreal situation. Why not just give it to one of the other mermaid women down there, who's got mermaid stuff and mermaid parts to feed it? My attempt at levity fell flat, the seriousness in Kweku's eyes anchoring me to the moment. You're more special than all the mermaids in the sea, he replied, his sincerity disarming. Despite my blush, I couldn't help but retort, Ha, ah, must not be much mermaids then. As I looked into his eyes, I saw not only the depth of his desperation, but the truth of his words. When our babies bond with their mother, they absorb her essence, her attributes, and her characteristics. Our babies take from their mother an unseen shield that protects them until they are old enough to be without it, he said. The notion that she might take on my characteristics through this bonding process was both amusing and terrifying. You want your baby to have my characteristics? I couldn't help but laugh, the absurdity of the situation momentarily lightening the mood. His earnestness, however, was sobering. It's a mermaid thing, he repeated. Please understand. Sobered, I gazed at him, his revelation swirling in my mind, this beautiful merman gazing back at me expectantly. Nope, I said, more casually than the situation warranted. I spun on my heels, strutting briskly back to the door, my sanity back intact. Nope, I said, and closed the door behind me. Dad was right. Boys were nothing but trouble. Seriously, did I look like a mother to him?